www.thepodcast.com. Now, we've got four great pairs tonight um, and I'm ready sort of to kick off, but I think it's best first if I introduce for those of you who haven't met, uh, Benjamin from the Fine Cheese Company. So good evening, Ben. Hello, how are you doing? Good, thank you. I'm, good. It's a bit warm here this evening. I don't know about you. Yeah, it is warm. Yeah, which is great because it's been raining for the last two days. So. <laughs> very, very true. And actually, when we first pulled together these, we were hoping it was going to be warm, being the 10th of August. And we've got some uh, great wines and great cheeses for, for warm weather as well. So particularly, I think, uh, yeah. The, these wines are perfect for this temperature. So if you don't have sunshine where you are, whether it's in the UK or otherwise, um, just pretend these are sunny wines. Um, Righty-ho. So to um, kick things off this evening, I'll just uh, let you know the order we're going to run in in case you are trying to um, pair as we go. Hopefully you are. We're going to start with the Chenin Blanc. Don't worry, I'll tell you before we do the pairs. But we're going to start with the Chenin Blanc paired with the Tunworth. We're then going to go to the Darenberg, and that is the Money Spider, Roussan, and that's paired with the Sheep Rustler. We've then got the uh, Beaujolais, the Domaine de Moulin d'Ol, um, and that is paired with the Sheep Rustler. And I will remind you, because we've done that with two wines, as well as the little roll right. And then we're finishing off on a Pinot Gris from Domaine Schlumberger, uh, and that is going with our blue at the end. For anyone who joined me last night, I did um, I did have the, the Domaine Schlumberger on there. So uh, there's a reason. And last night it was the winning wine in our blind tasting and it's just because it's absolutely fantastic. And last night's event didn't give me the opportunity to pair it with food. Whereas tonight, we do have that chance. So uh, should be absolutely smashing. So I think it's probably time to kick things off. We're going to talk wine first so that you can start um, tasting. And then we're going to hand over to Ben to talk about the cheeses. And don't worry if you're a bit confused because he will explain which one's which. Because I even get a bit confused, especially with the two softer cheeses. They're looking quite similar on my plate this evening. So... We're going to kick things off, like I said, with the Chenin Blanc from South Africa. Um, I'll show you the bottle, but we will be able to flash up a shot in a moment uh, of the web page. The wine is called Land of Hope, and I'll go into why in a moment. But in terms of what to expect in your glass, um, it's a real classic Chenin, and uh, it's... it's um, made by a gentleman called Alex Dale, who owns Radford Dale Winery. Um, and they're based in Stellenbosch, so you get lots of sunshine. We're expecting loads of ripe fruits. Um, and they describe this as their most boisterous Chenin, as quoted by Joe Locke here. And quite frankly, that's why I chose it, because this is a Chenin that really packs a punch. Um, they pick and sort the grapes. So there's a lot of care and attention taken uh, to picking those and they mature them on the leaves. And those are those dead yeast cells uh, which have uh, a sort of they bring a, a, a bready, yeasty um, note to the wine, but also huge amounts of texture. So loads of body. Um, as the map shows there, Stellenbosch. Lovely and warm, lots of bright sunshine, but a bit of coastal influence. So the other thing that comes from where it's where this wine is positioned are the lovely cool Cape Doctor winds. And that means that even though you have this unctuous wine, it's also got loads of acidity. And we love acid when we're pairing wines and foods. It's a friend of wine and food pairing. Um, it's also been aged in oak barrel for eight months. So there's been a lot of winemaking going into this wine. Um, for me, in terms of flavour, if anyone is has it in their glass and is tasting along, it's got apple, it's got brioche, it's got pear, it's got lemon, it's got peach, got a bit of everything. And then that lovely sweet spice that comes from uh, the oak as well. Now, this picture is particularly pertinent because not only did this wine win in a blind tasting, i.e. no background, no story, um, 
so it's, it's won wine champions for the second year in a row on the merit of the winemaking. And there's also an amazing story behind it. So the gentleman in the middle with the um, balding head is Alex Dale. Um, and he started a uh, trust along with some various other stakeholders in 2007 called the Land of Hope. And the Land of Hope sits under the Radford Dale uh, bucket and they make the wines at the winery, but the um, beneficiaries of this wine, so the profits of this particular wine, and they make this in an amazing Pinot Noir that we're launching later this year, um, or releasing the new vintage of, the, the beneficiaries of the profits of the, of the sale of these wines go to uh, previously disadvantaged individuals in South Africa, but in particular, they've, um, they were conscious that a lot of those sort of charitable trusts, the money just goes sort of into the abyss and some of them aren't very effective. So actually the sole beneficiaries of these are the winemakers themselves and their families. So uh, the main focus is education. So they send a lot of the um, previously disadvantaged individuals, children to school um, in South Africa. And I just love that. Yeah, that shot really sells the wine to me, even though I don't need it to be sold to me. Um, you know, what an amazing cause and a fantastic wine to match. So for me, it's all a bit win-win really. <laughs> Um, and I'll explain a little bit about why I paired it. In fact, actually, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you taste it. I'll let Ben talk about the cheese. And then between the two of us, we'll talk about why we think that the, the combo sort of works. And you can also tell us if you don't think it works. Uh, please feel free. But we're, we're going in with a bang on this one, aren't we, Ben? Yeah, absolutely. We were discussing before, weren't we, that this Tumworth's pretty ripe at the moment. Um, so, yeah, so this is the Tumworth. I cut it open earlier and it's it's just you know oozing out of its uh, out of its skin um but this is a tumworth um tumworth is made by stacy hedges um in hampshire and the hampshire cheese co um it's a i would say british camembert style um and it's the only one that we really have uh, that's camembert style so it's a soft cheese um it's only made in this two, 250 gram round um, they use uh, camembert eye, and they're just like the French use for uh, camemberts in Normandy. Um, it's a bloomy rind, it's pasteurised, um, and it's a traditional rennet. Um, originally, Tumworth was a, a raw milk cheese. Um, back in 2006 was their first year of making um, Tumworth, and that's the year that they won um, world champion at British Cheese Awards. Um, and that's the, basically, I, I've tried to choose cheese this evening that, um, that are all champions in their own right as well. So they're all being supreme champions at either the British Cheese Awards um, or the World Cheese Awards. So the British Cheese Awards are based down in the Bath and West showground. Um, and then the World Cheese Awards um, is dotted around the country every year. Um, so yeah, so this is Tunworth. Um, I can see on the rind, it's got that white coat over it. So the white coat is uh, candidum, so penicillium candidum, which gives a really nice uh, coat to the cheese. Um, and then you start to see a lot of these um, like orangey hues on the, uh, on the rind as well. And that's the camembert eye coming through. And that comes through at later stages of its, uh, of its, uh, of its life. Um, and it gives that real, um, I would say, more savoury, more vegetal, um, probably fungal um, flavours uh, to the cheese. Um, you expect from Tunworth and from Camembert that it's going to have cabbagey notes, um, you know, um, broccoli, um, that brassica family. Um, but I'm going to taste it with the wine because I haven't done that yet. Oh, in my opinion, Ben, you're missing out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll kind of give a little intro on why I, why I liked the pairing. Um, firstly, before I even tasted the cheese, Ben sent me the lists because he said, look, here we have four stellar award winning cheeses. Why don't, why don't we go with these? And I had the full wine champions list to choose from. So I thought, great, I, I'll, I'll pick something that 
that I think goes. Now, I'd never tried this cheese before, but doing a bit of research and with Ben's information, he said exactly this. It's like a, a mature camembert. And one of my favorite pairings in the world is Chenin Blanc and camembert. Now, traditionally, I'd probably, for, for a lighter style camembert, go with a Loire Chenin that has, um, not always, um, but maybe one of the sort of, sort of slightly lighter styles. Um, but as soon as this cheese arrived, I thought, hold on, it needs power and it needs body. Um, and this wine for me has it in spades. Um, I like the combination of that slightly vegetal plus apple. I think those two often work together. Um, and for me, sometimes a Chenin like this has an almost apple skin flavor to it. Um, and I really, really like that combo. Um, but because it is so rich, because it is so luscious and creamy and, and um, Ben, this is the wrong language, but <laughs> loose. Like, what word would I use to describe its consistency? Um, oh, I don't know, loose, oo oozy. Oozy, yeah, yeah, I like it. Because it's so <laughs> oozy as well, it does coat, that, coat your mouth. So you do get that kind of... Um, a kind of vegetally mouth coating sensation so Chenin has such good natural high acidity that it gives your mouth a bit of a spritz as well so you don't feel um you feel like you want to go back for more that's the thing you get the mouth coating and then you get the rinse and then you get the mouth coating and then you get the rinse so I find it a really Moorish combination I agree I think you just yeah you just want to go back for more don't you yeah, that's the danger of it, though. I don't think I'd stop. <laughs> um, but a lovely cheese. Members, let us know what you think of that particular cheese or if you have any questions for Ben and I on that cheese and that pair. Um, so just to, to reiterate, that pair was the Land of Hope Shannon and the Tunworth. So for anyone tasting along who's tried those two together, I do hope that you enjoyed it. Um, and if you didn't manage to get the cheese, then... Um, Ben, I suppose I suppose that you could probably a more mature camembert might work with this wine as well. Yeah, you could do that. I think any any camembert de Normandy um, that you buy, you need to make sure that you buy camembert de Normandy, um, which is raw milk um, camembert. I, I realise this isn't raw milk, and it was originally um, back in in the um, you know mid two thousands, but. Um, if you if you're buying it from a seed market, then I'd advise getting camembert de Normandy rather than uh, just a camembert. Okay, good stuff. Uh, we have had one question I've just seen pop up was, uh, do you have any English wines that would go with the Tunworth? Now we did do an English wine and cheese session, didn't we, Ben? Mm -hmm. so if members haven't watched it, um, definitely uh, definitely go back and watch it on our YouTube channel. And I think we'll probably do another one at some point as well, because there's such an amazing array to choose from. And um, the thing about um, not all English wines at all, but a lot of English wines at the moment tend to be less oaked. And that's to uh, preserve a lot of the, the high acid, the fruitiness, the freshness. Um, not exclusively, but often this kind of oaked and leaves stirred style of wine tends to suit more developed flavours. And those developed flavours tend to come from sunnier climates. So um, I'm not saying never, never say never. You've got me on a mission, Roger, now. I'm going to find an English wine that goes with the Tumworth. But I would say um, there are some English Chardonnays coming through, and those are um, more exclusively in the Chablis style, which I wouldn't necessarily go for with, with a cheese this ripe. Um, but I think maybe there might be, um, you know, there's more oak ageing on the horizon. Um, and there are a couple of wines that are starting to do so. So Kit's Coty uh, is one of those by Chapel Down, but you pay the price for it. Uh, we don't sell it, actually, but it's a very rich oaked Chardonnay. And that would probably work. But um, if you do buy a Kit's Coty, then invite me over because it's outside my price bracket. <laughs> um, ben, one more question before we move on. Um, Christopher just asks, how aged did you say that the Tumworth is? Or tends I, to I didn't say. Oh. I would say this Tumworth is probably six to seven weeks. We probably receive it around four weeks, I would say. Um, so it's a, it's, only, it's a day make. It's probably in the hastener for two or three days. Then it goes into the maturing rooms for a couple of weeks. And then it'll go firstly wrapped, 
So it would come to us about three to four weeks. This is, I would say, near the end of its shelf life, um, as we have to call it, but not that that really means anything in cheese world. Um, but I would say this is about six to seven weeks. Perfect, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, for me, I like that it's aged and developed and, you know, a bit yeah. like you say, if you'd got hold of it younger, you would have a bit of a different experience. Yeah. And in the wine world, it's a baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, Righty-ho. So in that case, I think it's time to move on to our second pair. I'll sadly move my Shannon away because that makes me upset for no more Shannon. But I am really pleased to hopefully introduce some of you to a new wine because... Um, it's perhaps less well known um, and certainly just, a, well, it's a little bit more unusual. Um, so the next wine I'm going to talk about uh, is the Money Spider and it is made by um, Darenberg and it is 100% of the grape variety Roussan. Now, uh, if you're a lover of the Northern Rhone or the Southern Rhone, then you may have had some Roussan before. But chances are you probably haven't, or maybe we've got some Money Spider fans in the house, but chances are you probably haven't had a 100% Roussan from Australia. Um, Roussan, as I said, is a Rhone grape varietal. It's often partnered with its sister. It's not, they're not related, but Marsan. Um, you often find them grown together, blended together, particularly in the South. Roussan is harder to grow. Um, so Marsan tends to be easier to grow and therefore more popular for, for blending and is, is just a bit of a more reliable grape variety. Roussan is a little tricky and it's fickle. And because of it, it's perhaps less, less common, but the wines it makes when it makes good wine are very age worthy. So they, um, they last a long time, they develop in the bottle, and that's just not something that Marsan can really compete with. It really does stand up, um, you know, to this sort of quality grapes of France. So um, in general, what you're looking, pardon me, <coughs> when you're tasting Roussan, you're looking for things like um, herbs, a bit of almond, um, all those sorts of lifted flavors but it's also got a really good waxy texture and that slight nuttiness and waxiness is why I think it's going to go with the sheep rustler because I do think it could be, they kind of complement each other beautifully in that sense um in terms of this other things I get from this when I first opened it it was quite floral and now it's been in my glass a while it's starting to develop those more nutty notes a bit more apple but certainly not as aptly as the last wine. Um, and then if we can just pop the picture up, some of you yesterday, I did do an at Darenberg wine last night, three of his wines won in Wine Champs, um, but this wine is from the McLaren Vale, which is that light purpley speck. So just south of Adelaide, you can see Adelaide there, that light purple speck is the McLaren Vale. They get great climate for growing these kinds of wines because they have a lovely cooling influence, but they get nice sunshine as well. If you imagine it's a grape from the Southern Rhone, it likes the heat. It's a sunbathing grape. Um, we do have a photo of their crazy winery next. Oh, no. First of all, McLaren Vale. Beautiful, lovely holiday destination. And then next up, I think we've got a picture of the cube as well. Uh, for anyone who knows Chester Osborne, who makes this wine, uh, he has, oh, we don't have a pic, sorry, that was last night. We have a, he's got a crazy art installation, which somebody had last night described it as a mad Rubik's cube, um, which it absolutely is. And it's got an art gallery and it's very much an experience. And he's crazy. He wears the wackiest shirts. If, if people have met him before, you won't forget Chester. Uh, he did do an event with us um, quite a few months ago now, last year. Um, and he'd had a few wines at lunch. It was one of the most entertaining events I've ever done. Uh, and yeah, if you haven't seen it on our YouTube channel yet, it's well worth a watch. Um, the way this is made is they keep it in steel, essentially. So they don't want to get too much oak. However, they do use a small batch basket pressing and that gets a little bit of oak, but not doing it in barrels. So you're not expecting this kind of big, rich, round, full uh, wine. It's much more gentle, much more delicate, much more sophisticated in a way than that. 
I've had a few of you say that you've got a bit of pétillance in yours. Um, I did too at the beginning and it's come off a bit. So a tiny bit of carbon dioxide trapped in the wine. Um, probably an intentional choice actually. What it tends to do, pétillance is, so it is literally just tiny pockets of air bubbles, not to make your wine fizzy. You're more likely to see it really than taste it in a wine like this. For something like a vino verde, you would leave a lot more of the, um, a lot more of the gas in there and then you really would feel a spritz. But what's really nice about this wine is the spritz just adds to the freshness. So it doesn't taste fizzy, but it just adds to that experience of freshness. Um, we do have a picture. Catherine's just kindly got it for my presentation last night. So if anyone hasn't seen the winery, here it is in all its, it's, this is the art installation, I should say. So this is the cube. You can go in here, have a wine tasting, see some art um, and it's right in the vines. So, um, truly a one of a kind wine experience down there at Darenberg. So thank you for that, Catherine. Um, I'll tell you one more final bit about this wine in particular before I hand over to Ben to talk about the cheese um, because it has much like the uh, Land of Hope, it also has a great story, but for completely different reasons. Uh, so we're drinking the 2020 vintage. Uh, originally, Darenberg had planted their, their Roussan, Marsan and Viognier, their Rhone grape varietals in the 1990s. And they planned on having their first vintage of Roussan and the first crop in 2000. But the year they uh, harvested it, it was covered in money spiders. And uh, the popular belief naturally is that money spiders bring good luck in the form of money. Chester refused to process the grapes. He didn't, he's a massive nature lover and he said, I'm not, you know, killing these money spiders in order to make my wine. So they let the, um, they let that vintage go and in, they didn't want to send the money spiders to their death. So instead they let that vintage go. They said, we'll try again next year. And uh, lo and behold, no money spiders. They'd learned their lesson. They'd moved away from the vineyards. Um, and hopefully, although the story doesn't say this, but hopefully Chester was rewarded um, for his kindness, but also his superstitions around money spiders. So he decided to call his 100% Roussan the money spider for that reason. So there we go. Finishing on a tail whilst we move on to the cheese with you, Ben. Thanks, Anna. Um, this is delicious, isn't it? And this pairing is, is really, really good. Um, so this, um, the next cheese is a uh, sheep wrestler, which is this one here. And um, I'll just quickly show you how I've cut that as well. So I've cut a portion off this way, and then I've cut it into slices this way. Just so you get the flavor from the outside of the cheese all the way to the inside, because the cheese matures from the outside to the in, um, and so you get different flavors right on the inside to you as you do on, on the outside. Um, but Sheep Rustler, um, so it's made by White Lake, um, just outside Glastonbury. Um, it was originally made by um, Roger Longman um, and Pete Humphreys. Um, Pete Humphreys um, was around at uh, White Lake for the last oh, 20 years, um, but now it's just Roger Longman. So this is Roger with his goats. Um, so one of the most famous cheeses from White Lake is called Rachel. Um, and Sheep Rustler is made on the same um, premise and recipe as Rachel, but it's sheep's milk. So White Lake make um, their cheese from milk, not from their own farm, but from surrounding farms. Uh, and they cho chose to make uh, Sheep Rustler. Um, with the local farm's um, sheep's milk. Um, it won the um, Supreme Champion um, 2018. And then it won the Anne-Marie Dias Award. So Anne-Marie Dias uh, was the founder of the Fine Cheese Co. Um, and she unfortunately passed a couple of years ago. But we have, um, we have an award every year at the British Cheese Awards um, for the best used milk cheese. And in 2019, um, Sheep Rustler um, won the best used milk cheese in the UK. Um, so it's, um, it's a hard cheese. It's thermized rather than pasteurized or raw milk. So that means before it goes into the vat, it's taken up to a temperature um, around 52 and a half degrees, then put into the vat. 
Um, it's a wash rind, um, but it's not a wash rind soft cheese like um, the next one, like, like roll rind. Um, it's a hard cheese, so they still wash it with brine, um, but it doesn't permeate, permeate through, the, um, through the paste uh, as much as a soft cheese does. Um, you get little flashes of yellow on the outside, um, and these are from the caves, um, which are perfectly um, great to eat. Actually, you, um, you see a lot of the yellow and red rind on, on Rachel, more so than you do on, on sheep rustler. Um, but it's vegetarian rennet, um, it's thermized, it's sheep's milk. Um, and we would say that it's verging towards a pecorino style. Um, probably a young pecorino. Um, but yeah, I think this pairing is absolutely delicious. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it's a very different pairing to the last one. Um, there was certainly, uh, you know, the last pairing, it was a mighty cheese and a mighty wine. And I think there's a bit more of a nuance in this. Um, for me, this pairing and the next pairing, and this is the part of the problem. I love the sheep rustler so much that I had to put it with two wines because they both work so well, um, which is why we did this order. So do not finish your sheep's, sheep's rustler, everyone. Keep a tiny bit um, because uh, it's, it's going to be great as well, I think, with the next wine. But it was a lovely, pleasant cheese to pair because actually it's it's delicate, it's nuanced, it's still flavorful, but it's not um, you know, it's not it's not so powerful, and it allows you a bit more of a broad spectrum of wines. And we've spoken about this a million times, Ben. But I think the tendency is hard cheese, red wine, mm -hmm. and for me, this you know, particularly the pecorino style, but but um, this even being a sort of lighter, brighter version, they're for me they're so much better with white wines and if you can find the right white wine white wine to make the cheese sing and vice versa then um yeah i sort of actually shy away from that old adage of red wine and hard cheese because it's so often not the case i completely agree I, I think the salt in this cheese is absolutely bang on as well um and i i feel like the wine shows through the nuttiness in the cheese I feel like I get more, you know, untasted nuts, peanuts for, from the cheese than, um, than I did when just eating the cheese on its own. I, yeah, I agree. And it's funny that because the wine isn't overtly nutty, but there are nutty nuances in it. And, um, and maybe it's that combination of slightly nutty, but very aromatic that, that really um, brings it out. We have had a question, Ben, before we move on. Yeah. Uh, it was around the thermizing. Does it kill kill the bugs like a pasture, pasteurization? <coughs> another reason you would do that. Yeah, so I know we, we, we've spoken about this quite quite a lot, haven't we? Pasteurization and, and thermization. But so pasteurization is a lot higher temperature and it's 72 degrees plus or minus. Depends how long you want to pasteurize it for. But pasteurization takes out a lot of bacteria um, when, um, um, when going into your vat. Now, the positive of pasteurization is that your milk is really easy to work with. Um, you don't have all of that bacteria running around. Um, you get a very consistent cheese. Now, the next level is thermization, so it's about 52 and a half degrees. Um, so you, you're still keeping in a bit of um, that bacteria that you get from um, from the you know from the flora, um, but you're also making it a little bit more manageable. Um, and then raw milk is you know you um, you have you know you work with the milk. You you don't you don't have a recipe. You just work with it. Um, whatever it's doing, you just you just go you know you you go along with it. Um, so. Came back to what was the original question? Sorry, it does, does it kill the bugs? Yeah, it was what's the does it kill the bugs? It, it kills it kills off some of the bacteria, but whether or not that's a positive or a negative, um, this cheese is beautiful. Um, all cheese goes through the same testing, so whether it's raw milk, thermite, or pasteurization at the end before it goes to someone like Fine Cheesecake. Um, so the the yeah, so the bacteria Can does, I does get killed off, but 
that's neither negative or positive. Okay. Yeah. Is it really positive? I know it's, <laughs> it's such a big subject. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose the question is, could a pregnant lady eat it? Um, probably three shouldn't. months old, I probably wouldn't. There we go. Lovely <laughs> stuff. Um, um, no, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, carry on, Ben. But that, but that goes into moisture content. So when it comes to pregnancy, it's all about moisture content within the cheese. And can listeria grow within the amount of moisture that's in that cheese? Rather than it being raw milk, pasteurised or uh, thermalised. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, now, we've had a couple of members who've been trying the Shenin with... Sorry, not the Shenin. Yes, been trying the cheese with the Shenin. Um, and have said that they highly recommend it. And if you try it with the Shenin, it brings out the honey bits instead. So... Uh, Feel free to uh, try that. Yeah, there's quite a few, quite a few members giving it a go now. Do try it. I think for me, the sheep rustler was really the cheese that we could have almost paired with anything. Probably not the last one, but I would say certainly the first three. It's a very, very versatile cheese. So uh, if you want to try it with the Shannon, go for it. I'm going to move on in the uh, instance of keeping time and talk about it with the Moulin Avant. But uh, members, so just to remind you, we are staying on that cheese and another cheese afterwards. So as I talk about the wine, the Moulin Avant, you can try it with your sheep's rustler that we've just spoken about. And then in a moment, Ben's gonna talk about the little roll right, which is the second cheese that I've paired with this wine. So you get double trouble on this one. Um, but yes, so Moulin Avant, uh, this particular, oh, I'll get you the bottle up as well, Le Forain. Uh, made by Domaine de Moulin d'Ol. Uh, it's 2019, so it's relatively young, but it's actually not made in the style that you want to age, really. Um, now, it's not been aged in oak barrels, and Moulin Avant is the, um, I used the word muscular last night, and I don't like that word. Um, the Moulin tends to be the bigger of the um, Beaujolais crew, uh, there's a few reasons for that. And here's a lovely picture of Beaujolais here. So you can see uh, the main part of Beaujolais is this light green bottom where you just get your Beaujolais. The dark green, you get the Beaujolais Village. And then that top section, you get the crew. Moulin Avant is unfortunately also green, <laughs> but it sits between Chenin and Fleury. Now, Fleury is uh, often described as the sort of lighter style. Sometimes people say Fleury is the queen of Beaujolais and Moulin Avant is the king. Um, but one of the reasons that Moulin Avant is so um, intense, shall we say, is that it's um, grown on very, very granitic soils. And what that tends to do, and here's a lovely picture of the, of the windmill it's named after, uh, but those soils are awful for growing anything other than wine, pretty much. They're really infertile. Uh, it means that the yields are much lower than the other crew of Beaujolais, and they make, or, or significantly lower than many of the other crew, and it makes really concentrated wine. Um, those pink granites, particularly for this wine, actually do make it harder to grow wine, but the wines that you grow are more intense. Um, Jancis Robinson calls it substantial. Moulin Avant is the most substantial of the Beaujolais crew. So I suppose that's another political way of saying it, but you, you know, um, it's very, very different to a Fleury and miles apart from something like a um, Beaujolais Nouveau, which is made completely differently. Really a Moulin Avant is moving towards more of a Pinot Noir style of wine, a, a red burgundy for a fraction of the price. But the difference with this wine is they've chosen to keep the fruitiness. And uh, to that end, they have avoided oak barrels. It's becoming very fashionable in Moulin Avant to oak your wines. Um, this particular producer has zigged when everyone else is zagging and for great effect because the concrete uh, vessels that he uses uh, Philippe is his name, Philippe Guérin, and he uses concrete and it means that the, the fruitiness and the freshness of the wine is preserved. Uh, you don't have oxygen sort of making its natural changes to the wine as you would in a barrel. Um, they do hand harvest, they use whole cluster presses, which does all sorts of things, um, but certainly many, many people think it contributes to freshness. Um, this to me is a summer wine for now. It's full of cherries, it's ripe, but it's not cooked. It's really tart, delicious. It's got a bit of wild bramble to it. But the other really nice thing about this is 
with this sort of brambly flavors, pardon me, it does move into a kind of an autumnal wine. So as much as this is delicious, a, a few members asked if I needed, if we needed to chill this. Um, I don't think so is the answer. Um, if it was a really hot day, if we'd been having the heat wave of a, of a few uh, weeks ago, I would have emailed you all in advance and said, pop it in the fridge for 20 minutes. Uh, it's claims it's 22 degrees here at the moment. That is too hot for this wine, but it has been in my um, in my garage until today. So it's been nice and chilled. Um, for me, a really classic, elegant, sophisticated, gorgeous Beaujolais um, that really, um, it's a bit of a bargain, actually, if I'm honest with you. For any Pinot Noir lovers out there, this is probably about as good as it gets when you're when you're looking for a replacement. So I'm going to enjoy that. Like I said, the two cheeses are, if you want to try it with the sheep rustler first, please feel free. Um, I know I said no, <laughs> no hard cheese and red wine, but I suppose this is a light style of red wine. It's, it's not, we're not talking big, heavy clarets or rones. Um, so I wanted to show you what happens. Uh, maybe you'll make the decision that you preferred the Roussan, who knows? Um, but then the next cheese uh, Ben's going to talk about. So I'll hand over to you, Ben, to talk about the little roll right. Yeah, so this one is next. I mean, ooh. This is your roll right. So roll right is a wash rind cheese. It's made by Dave Jarrett. Dave Jarrett uh, makes cheese in the Cotswolds. Um, he has a, a herd of um, dairy shorthorns, um, Ayrshire's. Um, he's fairly young for the Arsan cheese trade. Um, he's about 30 years old. And he started making, well, started making cheese about five years ago. Um, and he started making hard cheese and he wanted to make a, an alpine style, um, which make a comte or a gruyere or something like that meant that it was going to take a year or, or two years, you know, for him to see anything from, um, from his work. Um, so after, after six months, um, he decided he was, going to make a, he was going to make another alpine style, but a soft alpine style. Um, but British. So Roll Right is a wash rind. Um, it's spruce bound, like, like Vacheron Mondor. Um, so Vacheron Mondor um, from the Jura Mountains um, is spruce bound as well. So he gets his spruce from the same place um, the makers of um, Vacheron, Mon uh, Vacheron Mondor do. Um, so it's, uh, it's pasteurized um, and it's traditional rennet. Um, and as you can see, it has this orange um, glow to it. Um, and that shows that it, again, is wash wine, like the sheep rustler. Um, so a wash wine starts off as a soft cheese, as a bloomy rind. So it has a candidum rind that we saw that white on the, uh, on the tonworth earlier. Um, but then they wash it with something like brine or some kind of alcohol. Um, but Dave's is just with um, is just with a brine solution. Um, so Roll Right won um, the Supreme Champion in 2016 at the British Cheese Awards. Um, and recently he's made a cheese called Ashcombe. And Ashcombe won, basically we didn't have any awards in uh, 2020, as I don't know if, I don't know how the wine world worked, Anna, but um, we didn't do any awards or anything like we didn't do any judging but this year the first one we had was our sun cheese awards now that i think i said before but the three biggest awards are our sun cheese awards world cheese awards and british cheese awards we've had the our sun cheese awards in melton mowbray now ashcom his latest cheese which is a morbier style um that has won everything it won supreme champion it won um best hard cheese um best pasteurized cheese you know, you name it. He, you know, he had he had um, medals everywhere. Um, but Roll Right he, is his original cheese, um, and it comes in a, a one kilo version and also this little Roll Right, named after the Roll Right stones, which is just where he originally made um, he made this cheese. So I'm gonna taste it and see what it's like with the with the wine with the Beaujolais yeah, yeah. It's, I mean what an impressive um impressive winemaker yeah uh, winemaker sorry cheesemaker 
I'm so used to saying winemaker. Yeah, really impressive guy to be winning all these awards at such a young age. And um, yeah, it's a great cheese. Really lovely. Um, mine's been sat under these warm lights and is slightly sliding down my plate, but that even makes it more fun, doesn't it? The sort of gooiness and deliciousness of it. It's really, really great to eat. Yeah. Um, and for anyone who has, um, who for everyone who has got the wines and has tried the Beaujolais with it, Hopefully what you might have seen is that um, with the sheep rustler, uh, for me, that that sort of brought out being slightly saltier, I'd say, probably not actually salt and Ben, you can correct me, but um, it brought out maybe a bit more of the fruit. Whereas here, um, for me, the roll right brings out a bit more of the tannin and it makes it sort of a little bit more... Um, maybe a little bit more what you would have expected of a red wine, a bit more of that classic structure of a bit of tannin with the acidity. Um, but it's lightness and it's freshness still to me really marries well with with uh, with this. I think it's really good to compare the tube against one wine. Mm. I really like that because it, it does completely different things to the wine and to the cheese. Yeah, and I thought that they went, they both went well, but for very different reasons. And um, it comes down to personal preference, doesn't it? Yeah. Which version of the wine, you know, did you like? Did you like it with the sheep's where it was a bit more, yeah, uh, the wine became slightly fruitier? Or did you like it with the um, little roll right where perhaps the wine became a little bit more structured or, or tannic? Yeah, yeah. Um, Alan has asked if he's based his cheese on Jura styles of cheese, which Jura wines would go with it. Oh, well, I think you'd be hard pressed not to, to pair Sauvignon with it. Um, and that would be a great, a really great uh, pairing. There is also a white grape that escapes me that we did recently. Maybe Catherine or Gil will remind me. We had a lovely taste in Catherine where we did... Uh, It'll come back to me, or at least uh, at, at least Catherine will remind me in a moment. Um, the yes, but Sauvignon would be fantastic, and actually, I would probably. The thing about the the wines of Jura Jura it are um, they're Alpine wines, so they have high acidity. They're grown at altitude, uh, so they have that lovely freshness. All of the things that would go well with this because of that rich sort of mouth coating that we spoke about actually in the first pairing. Um, it does have that. A, a lot of the wines would have enough freshness and a lot, enough um, acidity um, and spark to go with that. Um, Christopher has asked, are we eating the bark? I.e. is the rind no, edible? Please don't. <laughs> don't eat the bark. The spruce, okay. the spruce bark is one, to keep it in its form, um, and two, because it embarks a really good uh, woody flavour into the cheese. But please don't eat the bark. Lovely, <laughs> not the actual <laughs> bark. Um, fair enough, I can understand that. Um, for the member who asked about the Savoir cheese, it's going to bother me so much that I'm going to find out. And in my follow up email, I will email you because there is a white uh wine we did recently, and the name is just escaping me. So I'm going to send you the link if it's still available. Um, okie dokes. Well, uh, I think for me. I'm not going to tell you actually which of the two cheeses is my favourite. Members, we've got a poll at the end with all five pairings. Um, by the sounds of things, I should have done one for the Shannon and the first che uh, second cheese as well, but uh, never mind. So if you do particularly like a, a pairing this evening, we're on to our final one, obviously, but if you did like any of them, please write them down so that you remember. I know how hard it can be to remember after, uh, after four glasses of wine. So please do remember and then we'll do a poll at the end because I'm fascinated fascinated to see which one your favorite was so uh moving on to the final wine and cheese um and as i mentioned i did do the uh did do this wine in last night's pairing but i did it blind and if you bought the pack you would have only had a 50 centiliter portion so since it was the favorite wine of the night i think i've done everyone a favor so if you did join both events hopefully now you have a bottle of it to enjoy and you didn't have to go about ordering a second one um, but the main reason I was more than comfortable doing it twice in a row is actually because last night we tasted it blind and tonight when we taste it with food, it is going to be completely different. And that's the joy of food and wine matching for me. So it will be like you've got a different wine. 
So uh, the wine we do have is, and mine's going to be a tiny little bit too warm, but if you are going to get it out of your fridge now, please, please do so, because we're going to be talking about the Domaine Schlumberger uh, Grand Cru from, from the Grand Cru site Kessler, and it's the 2015. Uh, like I said, you can thank me for ordering it because it has sold out, um, much to my horror, actually, because I, after last night's tasting, did consider that I probably should have ordered a couple of bottles myself. Uh, but there we go. These things happen. Uh, so if you are going to get it out of the fridge now, please come and join us. And we will also be pairing it in a moment with the blue cheese, which I'll allow Ben to talk about. So Schlumberger is a lovely winery uh, based in the Alsace. And again, the picture I nicked from last night, but here is the Alsace region of France. And um, the Alsace, some of you will know, but for those who don't, I'll do a quick introduction about why it's so special. Um, you may notice the bottle shapes, so their flute shapes look like German wines, but they're not. But actually Alsace has been passed between German and French occupation. Uh, many times it's right on the border of Germany, you can see it there, and what this map doesn't show you, so although you can beautifully see Germany to the east, <laughs> what it doesn't show you is to the west, it looks like the vineyards are in a line, and they actually are because they're on the slopes of this mountain range called the Vosges, V-O-S-G-E-S, -E um, and those mountains protect all of the vines of Alsace. So what you end up with is a region that's nice and far north, so you get lovely freshness, acidity, all of those things that come with a cooler climate growing, growing area. <coughs> but you get brilliant sunshine hours and very little rain because those mountains protect uh, from the cooling too cold winds and from the intense rainfall. So it's actually the dry, second driest growing region in the whole of France, only after the Languedoc. This particular wine, made by Domaine Schlumberger. Uh, Domaine Schlumberger have been around since 1810, and the Grand Cru that this is based on, Kessler, was established in 1830. So they began making wine in 1810, and then this particular Grand Cru, which is based down in the south, uh, which is, has a beautiful little uh, valley section exactly there. Thank you, arrow pointer. Um, so this particular Grand Cru, um, was then established in 1830. So they've known for a very long time that fantastic wines are made in this part of Alsace. That what, what this all affords it, or what this means can happen, is with these very little, um, very little rainfall, there's low fungal disease, there's no reason they need to pick the grapes, they're not going to go bad whilst they're sat on the vine, but they're cool, they, it's cool enough up north and it's got high enough diurnal range, i.e. those lovely cool evenings and sunny daytimes, that also the acidity doesn't drop. Because what happens when you leave grapes on a vine for too long is they get these beautiful flavors developing, but the acid just goes through the floor. And unfortunately, as flavors sort of tend to develop and sugars rise, and that's the important bit, as the sugars are rising, the acidity is going down. But because this cool climate with sunshine, uh, you can actually leave your grapes on the vine much longer. And what that allows Alsace to do that's really particularly special to this region in France and arguably the world is that it can produce sweet wines that you don't have to have botrytis like you do in Sauterne or that you don't have to dry the grapes uh, on drying mats or you don't have to freeze the grapes like ice wine. You can just get naturally sweet wines not overtly sweet. And I mentioned yesterday, the sugar in this wine is 25 grams per litre. If you were drinking a Sauterne or um, even worse, a Tokai Sauterne, you'd expect sort of 250 grams per litre or more. Tokai even more than that. And um, so we're not talking excessive, you know, I don't like to use the word dessert wine or pudding wine because that's not exclusively what they're for. But you don't get this sort of actual sweet wine flavor. You get what's in your glass here, which is medium sweet. And for anyone that knows, I have a penchant for pairing medium sweet wine with salty foods. Now I had this with a vegetarian curry last night or the tiny little bit I had left from my portion. Uh, and it was delicious because it works, that sweetness works with the spice. But the other thing the sweetness works so well with is saltiness. And interestingly, with this level of sugar, you actually don't want to pair it with a sweet food 
because the sweetness in the food, if you had this with a, a lemon tart, the lemon tart would be very, very sweet and the wine would then taste flat by comparison. So actually you would want, um, you would want to have this with something else. And the things that tantalize my taste buds most of all about these wines are spicy foods, so Asian foods in particular, where you have that kind of uh, lemon grassy flavor or salty foods. Now that could be this lovely blue cheese, or it could be, if you're feeling really adventurous, a pork, a pork belly with really salty crackling. Um, it could be, if you want it for breakfast, a bacon sandwich, you know, each to their own, but that saltiness is gonna bring out so much more of the sweetness and the tropical fruits in this wine. Uh, it's already full of mangoes and light cheese and all those sorts of things, but try it first, taste it, and then try it with your blue cheese and you should just get this sort of elevated sweetness. And then yes, absolutely, finishing on the picture of the lovely Severine who makes this wine. So that's her on the left. Uh, she is, oh gosh, don't know how many generations actually. Uh, many generations of the Schlumberger family, and this is her with Jo Locke, MW, our buyer. Um, she's been a, a great asset and a friend to the Wine Society, so um, it's fabulous to support her wines. Um, so I'm really pleased to be showing you this. So yes, do taste it, and like I said, taste it first, and then taste it after the blue cheese that Ben's just about to talk about, because it's amazing what food and wine does. So thank you, Ben. That's okay. Uh, so I think it's pretty obvious that we're going to the the, the bath blue now. Um, so when we're cutting it, um, we're putting on its side and we're cutting down this way. So we can taste the centre and also right to the rind. And I would eat the rind on blue cheese as well. Um, it's natural rind, so it gives you lots of flavour. And also it's contrast to the, to the, to the paste of the cheese. Um, so bath blue is made just outside of bath. Um, the blue cheese that they make is the, the latest edition, um, but they are fourth generation cheese makers and they started off in the early 1900s. Um, but at the moment, um, the, the youngest, um, who's around, I'd say mid 40s, is probably going to love me for saying he's mid 40s when we were a bit older, uh, Hugh. Um, Hugh is uh, the head of the dairy. And his dad Graham is still running the farm. Um, so they make this beautiful um, blue cheese, which is a Stilton recipe. Um, that's that's he right there um, with his Frisians. So they ever heard about 150 Frisians, uh, and they make Bath Soft from that, which is a square soft cheese. They make Merry Wife. Um, I don't know if you've used that before, Anna. Um, they make Wife of Bath uh, and then their latest edition, which is um, which is Bath Blue. Um, so yeah, so uh, general Stilton uh, recipe. So I, I, I know I've mentioned before on, on other calls, but if um, if people um, haven't been on those calls before, how does blue cheese become blue? And that's right at the beginning. So we have our milk. This is, um, so it's pasteurized, so it goes through pasteurization, and then it comes into the fat, and then at start of um, start of culture phase, which is right, right at the beginning, we're adding um, penicillium uh, rock forti, um, and that's right at the beginning when it's in the fat, and then it'll, it'll leave, it'll be left for, you know, maybe a couple of hours um, before they put rennet in. And then the cheese would, at maturation phase, once we've done everything else, um, maybe be left for about a month before it's pierced. So the cheese will not be blue until it's pierced because you can't um, you can't uh, flourish the uh, the the blue veins without um, without oxygen. Um, so the blue goes in right at the beginning, and then after a month, um, it'll be pierced. Um, and you will, you'll get these uh, blue veins throughout the cheese. Um, I think for a pasteurized blue cheese, which is traditional rennet as well, I think you get a lot of flavor from the farm. And this is when we spoke earlier about does it kill off all these bugs and that bacteria. And in certain cheeses that are pasteurized, yes, it does. But I do bath softy something something else. 
And I don't know if it's because they take care of their herd so so well, and, and it's an organic farm as well. Uh, and I and I don't know if, if that's why you you do taste the farm through the cheese. Um, but yeah, it's it's absolutely stunning. It's about um, three months old, I would say. It's fairly young. You see on the rind, it's um, it's a little bit pale. Um, I would say that in its last stages, five to six months, it would be a lot darker than that. Um, and the curd is quite light as well. Um, but you do get a little bit of breakdown from the edge of the cheese. So yeah, I would say it's, it's probably um, about three and a half, four months old. Um, but the pairing. It's good fun, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, because I think so often you, you do get people say blue cheese and so tan. And yes, that is lovely. Um, for a lot of sweet wine lovers, that massive amount of sweetness is great. But you don't actually need that much sweetness in your wine to start this experiment and to start this sort of um, flavour battle. Um, it's lovely because actually it brings out a little bit more savoury um, feeling in, in the cheese. It brings out a bit more of the sugar in the wine but it's not it, it doesn't you know it just brings everything into a little it's like putting a bit of a microfire um uh, magnifying glass um onto both of them you know it just lets you think about them a bit more and i think for me that's such a nice thing about cheese and wine pairing it's so easy and we all do it just to have whatever wines on the table and bring out whatever cheese you've bought from the supermarket um and everybody's guilty of it i did it this weekend um, but I do think that there's, you know, when you think about it and when you've experimented and I tell you members, there's nothing more fun than doing a cheese and wine experiment. When Ben sends me the cheeses to try, it's my favourite, favourite day of the month um, because it's amazing how different they are. And obviously we've done a bit of dabbling and comparing one cheese and two wines. And a few of you did did a bit more than that in your own um, experiments in your kitchen and your living rooms. But actually yeah being able to see how different cheeses and different wines interact for me is an absolute blessing so this pairing does that in spades i like how how because the cheese is so savory it really is and the wine is a little bit sweet but not too sweet i i think it, um yeah i think it goes pretty well I, I really like it i'm enjoying it fab yeah i'm glad i'm glad and like you say, not too sweet, a little bit sweet, not too sweet. Yeah. <laughs> um, fabulous. So we have got a couple of questions, Ben, if it's all right for me. Um, I've got a very generic one for you, but I think members have um, opened their wines and their cheeses this evening. I can tell you now your wines will keep as long as you cannot drink them, really. <laughs> uh, the screw cap and cork thing doesn't really matter too much if you just pop the corks back in or pop the screw caps back on put them in the fridge even the red wine it will tend to preserve it a little bit better you've probably got a week for most of these shannon in particular i think could actually do with a bit of oxygen so that's no bad thing i'd drink uh yeah they'd all be fine i'd probably actually drink the moulin avant the quickest um because that's intentionally been made without any oxygen so uh, if you have opened them all and you're thinking about what to uh, drink up this evening or also how long things are going to keep then that's the answer wine wise but Ben for people who've opened their cheeses this evening how long would you keep these in the fridge and I know we've had this question before but I find it fascinating what's the best way to store them because I okay. would, used to be naughty <laughs> so um if you the first one that you should be eating is the Tumworth because Tumworth is super bright now I would say that that's going to last up until the weekend. And it's, you know, at, at the very last. Um, but you can cook with it. So put it in something uh, or bake it and, you know, um, have some garlic and some rosemary and, you know, some olive oil and a bit of salt and pepper. Like, you know, that's, um, that's, that's pretty easy. After that, I would say roll right. So it's the high moisture cheeses that aren't going to last so long. Now, a cheese has a you know has a best before, and especially a whole cheese. So this is the uh, this is the twenty eighth of this month. But if I feel this cheese, and when we when we're cutting it, we know that it's not going to be it's still okay on the on the twenty eighth because we've cut into it. If we looked after it and we had it in our cheese rooms, 
then it would last till 28th, but we've cut into it and, and you know, we started to eat it. So again, after the time, I would, I would try and eat the roll right as soon as possible. And again, you can do the same with um, with the roll right as, as you do with tamar. It'll taste very different, but you know, we compared it to Vashram Mondor earlier, but we bait Vashram Mondor. And so we bait, we, we bait roll right. Um, and then Bath Blue. So it depends how much you've eaten. Um, so this piece here, I would say that will last about another seven to 10 days. Uh, wrapped up. The larger the piece, the longer it's going to last. Um, it'll just lose moisture, that's the only thing. Um, and then we've got a hard cheese, which doesn't have much moisture, and so it will last the longest. Um, so I'd, I would give the sheep breast um, again, I would say the upper end, so 10 days. And wrapping it, wrap it in what it came in. So when it comes to the blue cheese, we wrap it in perforated wrap and then wax paper. So perforated keeps it away from the wax paper so it stops it sweating so much because you've got high moisture. So yeah, try try not to, um, oh, please don't wrap it in cling film. Because <laughs> <laughs> it just created a sweat box for my cheese. Exactly, yeah, and it's, and it just it makes it warmer than it wants to be, and it makes it more snug than it wants to be, which means that it's going to ripen so quickly, and that's definitely what you don't want. Um, if you don't have um, you know any wax paper left or anything like that, or they have that lovely beeswax wrap now as well, which is perfect for cheese. But if you don't have that, um, maybe use foil, but maybe put some um, um, some baking. Um, sheet in between the foil and the cheese just so it has a little bit of room to breathe and then put it in a tupperware and put it in the bottom of the fridge in the veggie drawer exactly yeah fabulous thank you now we've got um a question about uh i'll tell you what i'll do the question on the recipe first because we have had somebody ask whether you have any ideas of what recipes might be good for the tonworth in the next few days and i know i'm putting you on the spot ben so don't worry we can email we can email an after, afterwards answer if you uh, haven't got one to mind ah oh, catherine has one okay we've cool. got a wine society one apparently so there we go <laughs> I got me, that got me off the hook, didn't it? <laughs> Catherine from behind the scenes is going to post one, Karen. So she'll post it in the chat, um, which is great. So there we go. We, we're already Tamworth fans at the Wine Society. Um, and even if it's not a Tamworth and I got that wrong, it might be a Camembert one. But I think it probably is a Tamworth. If I know Steve, Steve Farrow, our recipe creator. Raymond Blanc um, has a really good recipe because Raymond Blanc said that it was the best Camembert in the world. Ah, yeah. fantastic. So you heard it there first. So we've uh, resident foodie Steve Farrow's put his recipe for mushroom and chestnut puff pasties using Tunworth. So there we go. And the Raymond Blanc one, I will dig out members and I will um, include it in the email roundup tomorrow as well. Uh, we've had another question uh, from Helena Whitaker, which I think is probably more for me, but I know that you might have an opinion on it, Ben. Um, if using Chenin and Pinot Gris, et cetera, to match with the cheese, how does that impact the cheese pre or post dessert debate? Now, I have parents who live in France and a dad that trained, or they didn't hand it over to me, sadly, uh, but did quite a lot of cheese training, if that's such a thing, in France uh, when we were growing up. So I have never believed in dessert before cheese. Um, but I get your point. How does it impact the post, the debate? Because quite frankly, for um, the Pinot Gris in particular, I would I would not have had that with my main unless I did have my Asian five spice pork belly. Uh, but chances are I hadn't. I would be opening that wine fresh. Um, I would then probably actually um, either open another wine for dessert if I was being very wild. Um, but if not, um, I would probably finish it before I have my dessert, um, depending on the dessert. You know, I'm not going to be pairing a chocolate pudding with that. And as I said, a lemon tart, et cetera, would not work either. But a really bitter fruit salad might. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't do it, but you could. Um, but for me, pudding is always the last thing. 
cheese comes in the middle, the French do it, they use up the wines around the table. And I know that that's the, the ethos behind it. So I do appreciate that what I've just said kind of contradicts that because we're going to be opening a brand new wine. But prime example would be the Moulin Avant. If I'd had a nice um, duck breast or a um, mushroom risotto or even something a little bit lighter, uh, if I'd had a barbecue and had this Moulin Avant, I would be more than happy to keep this bottle open and move right onto the cheese using this bottle. So that's why. I'd be less inclined to have this with my apple strudel. So that's my argument. Ben, do you have a thought on it? I completely agree. That's exactly how we would do it as well. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in France when I was younger and, and that's how it's always been done. I know a lot of the English don't do it that way, but I think that's that's the way to do it. It, it makes it difficult, but... It does. It's logistically slightly more challenging. Yeah. Um, even more so if you do what we quite like to do sometimes in our house and have a a sweet fizzy wine at the end because then there's all sorts of opening and all sorts of admin sometimes the admin's the fun bit you need a bit of drama um it's a bit of fun isn't it yeah but, exactly there isn't a, there isn't a proper way to do anything it's however you want to do with your family and yeah, yeah. it's a bit of fun exactly um and uh sam and i when we were planning our wedding in france we're uh, we're still hoping to do the party next year for members that say oh you've already got married um we did our english wedding but we are planning on having a party in france next year and we came to the compromise that we would do sharing platters of uh mini petit four and small pieces of cheese in the middle and we'd have uh, mon basiac and we'd have something else and people could do whatever they wanted because trying to trying to navigate the politics of that scares me <laughs> <laughs> lovely okie doke so i'm conscious of time so we do have a poll members um and i think Catherine is going to pop it up now for us or possibly gill apologies so very simple um i'm not going to ask you your favorite wine and i'm not going to ask you your favorite cheese because the point of this evening was pairing them together <laughs> so just taking you back we had the stellenbosch land of hope shenan uh, and that was with the tumworth at the beginning that gorgeous yellow um, what word did we use? Uzi, an Uzi job. <laughs> and we had the Darenberg Money Spider Roussan, and that was with the Sheep La Rassler, so the Pecorino equivalent, if you want to call it that. Then the uh, Beaujolais, again with the Pecorino, I did include both. Then the Beaujolais, so you have to, don't immediately take number four if you, if you thought it was the fourth pairing, because we snuck the other one in there. So we had the Beaujolais with the roll right. So again, um, that lovely sort of soft, don't eat the bark job. And then finally the Pinot Gris with the bath blue. So please, please, please um, pop your thoughts in. I'm going to ask Ben as well. We're not allowed to vote as panelists, which seems very cruel. Um, but I think we've probably given people enough time to argue amongst themselves. So if we Just can, uh, let's yeah, not reveal it yet. If we just take the poll down, then I'm going to ask Ben and then we can reveal it, if that's all right, Catherine. So Ben, your favourite pairing. So my favourite pairing was Sheet Rustler um, with the... the spider money. Monkeys? Yeah. Nice. That was my favourite. I thought it was peaceful. I'm tempted to say the same, but for the sake of argument... <laughs> To be a bit different, I'm going to go with the final pairing. I'm going to go with uh, the blue cheese and the uh, Domaine Schlumberger, just to see. So let's see what members have said. Uh, oh, look at that. So Land of Hope Shannon was the winner. Yeah. Um, I'm glad to hear it. It's um, We started off with, a, with all guns blazing. So 39% of people voted that as their favorite. So I'm thrilled. But I am also pleased to say, and so far this hasn't failed us yet, but every single pairing got some votes. Um, but in second place was the Pinot Gris Grand Cru Schlumberger with uh, the blue. So thank you everyone that voted. If you didn't get to vote, do feel free to pop it in the chat and let us know anyway. Your votes will not be counted. <laughs> um, but yes, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you've got any other questions and want to drop them in over an email, please feel free. Um, and otherwise, I'm going to get those recipes to you tomorrow, as well as the uh, Jura wine that I forgot. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten. Uh, so I will get all of that across to you tomorrow, members. And we hope to see you at another one of these soon. Ben and I are already plotting the next three. Isn't that right, Ben? 
three. All yeah, three. we've got three <laughs> coming down the tracks, members. So I hope that you enjoyed them. We've got plenty more wine cheese combos to enjoy. Um, and now that we can, a lovely thing to do with friends. So uh, do feel free to um, join us again. It will be a diff- it will be different every time. It always is. Um, but just before we go, I'd like to thank Catherine and Gil behind the scenes. And then a huge thank you to Ben for joining us this evening and arranging all of the cheeses for everyone. So thank you, all three. Cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Good evening.